Wow, my teeth are pure corn. It's cold. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Woo! It's Crew Trime, brother. I am an actual idiot. <laughs> my name is Sarah, and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like fun to you, you are in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel, turn on all of the notifications, and then that way it'll let you know whenever I upload a new video. Today's case has been recommended quite a few times, but most recently by Colleen T from Canada and from Jennifer Noel of Fayetteville, Georgia. Thanks ladies, I appreciate you. Today's story actually took place in Jennifer's backyard there in Georgia, um, and it's pretty terrible. So let's get to it. This is the story of Chris Benoit. On June 25th, 2007, the American Bank Center in Corpus Christi, Texas, was making final preparations for that evening's event, World Wrestling Entertainment's Monday Night Raw. That, uh, that's a professional wrestling show. <laughs> Unless you live under a rock, you know what WWE is. Is even if you don't watch it. It's a combination of actual real life wrestling and fictionalized drama with characters and storylines. It's, I mean, it's soap opera for bros. Anyway, that evening's show was meant to be a three hour tribute to Mr. Vince McMahon, the chairman, right? Whose character had supposedly been killed in a limousine explosion. Sometime that afternoon before the show, a meeting was called with the senior producers and some of the cast. As the group gathered around the wrestling ring, the real Vince McMahon, the chairman of the WWE, told them he had some very serious news. He said, we just just got word that Chris Benoit, his wife Nancy, and their son Daniel have all passed away. What? Chris Benoit was not scheduled to perform at that evening's event, but he was a colleague and a friend to all of them. And Chris was a wrestling superstar, so this was unbelievable. So what happened? Well, hang on, I'll tell you. But we're gonna need to start from the very beginning. Christopher Michael Benoit was born on May 21st, 1967 in Montreal, Quebec, Canada to Michael and Margaret Benoit. He and his sister, Lori, grew up in Edmonton, Alberta. And as a young boy, he was quiet, and kind. When he was six years old, he was actually in a pretty serious car accident where his head struck the windshield and he was hospitalized for like three days. The doctors at that time feared, you know, a traumatic brain injury, but he actually made a full recovery. Chris was fluent in both English and French, you know, pretty common for our Canadian friends. Mon français est mauvais. He was a very athletic, rough and tumble boy and he loved wrestling. By the time he was 12 years old, he was obsessed. He idolized the hero good guy wrestlers like Tom Dynamite Kid Billington and Brett the Hitman Hart. A little side note, our realtor that sold our house loved Brett the Hitman Hart too. So at closing, we bought him a bottle of champagne and a t-shirt that said, the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. If you know, you know. Anyway, back to Chris. He knew early on that he wanted to become a professional wrestler and his family supported him completely and his dad even bought him his first weight room setup. At 18, Chris had sought out the best training possible, not only for wrestlers, but you know, for football players and weightlifters. It was the legendary Hart family dungeon. It sounds sketchy, but it's just dramatic, like professional wrestling. Founded by Stu Hart, father of Brett the Hitman Hart, the dungeon was a gym in the basement of the Hart's, you know, large mansion in Calgary. So every Friday, Chris would get on a bus and ride it to Calgary so that he could train there all weekend. The dungeon was a pretty big deal, you know, some famous names that also trained there include Edge, Chris Jericho, Mark Henry, and Rowdy Roddy Piper. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum. It was in the dungeon where Chris perfected maneuvers like sharpshooter and the flying headbutt. Chris's wrestling style was very dynamic and exciting, but pretty high risk. For example, part of his show included him being hit in the head with metal folding chairs. And unlike football, there ain't no helmets in professional wrestling. 
So you can see where this is going. Anyway, Chris Benoit was exceptional, dedicated, talented, motivated, physically remarkable, and he quickly established himself as someone to watch in the wrestling scene. By 1985, Chris began his professional career with Stampede Wrestling, which was based in Calgary, founded by Stu Hart, naturally. Stampede was actually purchased by the WWF, World Wrestling Federation, for a time, and then sold back to the Hart family. But the point is, it was very much intertwined with large-scale professional wrestling and part of the history of the WWE. And there's a lot of letters around pro wrestling, like WWF, <gasps> WCW, <gasps> WWE. <laughs> I'm sure there are differences that enthusiasts can pick apart in the comments, but to me, it's all, it's all the same thing. So Chris began to dominate every challenge put in front of him. And remember I said he was kind of risky. His best moves were the flying headbutt, the snap suplex. <laughs> These are incredibly dangerous maneuvers, you know? And just because professional wrestling is essentially a well-crafted show, you know, rehearsed, choreographed, sort of, it doesn't make those moves less risky to the body. And Chris's signature moves involved headfirst falls or headfirst strikes to the opponent. You know, he'd climb up the ropes of the ring and then leap. And this is like a 250 pound giant action figure, man. <laughs> Jumping on or getting jumped on by another giant person. So many wrestling moves, especially finishing moves, have been banned over the years because of safety concerns. Typically the move is in use for a while with no problems until there's an accident and then it gets the but the bottom line is even though the stars of the wrestling ring, Chris included, are living their childhood dreams, it's still work. And it's kind of hard to keep working if your job requires you to ruin your body. Anyway, Chris became a local star in the scene and he even worked in Japan for a few years through the New Japan Pro Wrestling and World Championship Wrestling's Talent Exchange Program. While he was in Japan, he met and became besties with another talent exchange wrestler named Eddie Guerrero. When Chris was on a short break from Japan, back in Calgary, he won his first wrestling championship in 1988, the Stampede British Commonwealth Mid-Heavyweight Championship. It was also around that time that he met 25-year-old Martina at a party while home in Calgary. They were married in 1988 and ended up having having two children together, a son, David, and a daughter, Megan. Now, during their marriage, the focus was pretty singularly on Chris's career. And during those years, he was also known in the ring as the Wild Pegasus or the Pegasus Kid. It wasn't until later that he started using just his own name, Chris Benoit. And as Chris gained more success in wrestling, the marriage just grew further apart. Well, fast forward to 1995, Chris had gotten the attention of the nature boy, Ric Flair. Ooh. He was hand selected to become a member of the WCW's revamped Four Horsemen storyline. So Chris, nicknamed the Crippler, joined Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, and Brian Pillman. And the Four Horsemen were bad guys or heels. So these fictional storylines and rivalries and even the outcome of the matches, it's all part of what they call kayfabe. And as part of kayfabe for the four horsemen, Chris started feuding with a former wrestler and current WCW booker named Kevin Sullivan. And that evolved into Chris having an affair with Sullivan's on-screen valet woman, played by Kevin Sullivan's real-life wife, Nancy. So to really sell this storyline, the kayfabe, Chris and Nancy were directed to spend time together off camera, out of the ring. You know, to make the affair seem more real. They would hold hands in public, things like that. Kevin Sullivan, I'm taking away everything that means anything to you. Nancy, apparently you don't have a whole lot to say about this, do you? Not at all, Gene. Not at all. Then, surprise, surprise, the affair became real. <laughs> Remember, pro wrestling events are like a traveling circus, like a concert tour. You know, they travel from city to city putting on these shows. So the performers, these athletes, they stay in hotel rooms away from their families. So Chris and Nancy had a lot of opportunity, we'll put it that way. So then the kayfabe between Chris Benoit and Kevin Sullivan became 100% real. Nancy filed for divorce from Kevin and Chris's wife Martina filed for divorce 
divorced, took their two kids and moved out. And by 1997, Nancy moved in with Chris. So who is Nancy? Nancy Elizabeth Toffoloni was born on May 17th, 1964 in Boston, Massachusetts, but she actually grew up in Orlando, Florida. Nancy was gorgeous, you know, she did some modeling work in the mid 1980s and then she found herself working at events in the local wrestling scene and then later started wrestling herself in the women's circuit. And that's where she met one of the pro wrestlers, Kevin Sullivan, who convinced her to join his act. Well, long story short, they became romantically involved and eventually married. Nancy actually had a couple of different stage names, but she eventually landed on woman. And then she also started managing Kevin's career along with a few other very high profile pro wrestlers. She was also part of this kayfabe for the four horsemen hanging on the arm of one nature boy, Ric Flair. Nature boy! So, Fast forward a few years and now we're caught up with how she and Chris Benoit ended up together. Chris and Nancy lived together for a few years before Nancy got pregnant. Their son, Daniel Christopher Benoit, was born on February 25th, 2000. Eight months later, on November 23rd, Chris and Nancy got married. After the baby was born, Nancy retired from the ring and she spent the majority of her time at home raising their son and managing Chris's business affairs. So by this time, Chris Benoit's wrestling career was on fire. His on-screen storyline continued to sort of bob and weave. You know, he eventually left the Four Horsemen. He joined the Radicals, and that's Radicals with a Z friends. And we'd be here all day if I started getting into the championships and the titles and I also just don't really care. <laughs> but suffice it to say, he was very successful. This footage here is Chris Benoit wrestling with Kurt Angle. Kurt is the one in the adorable little onesie. <laughs> Singlet. Whatever. I actually saw Kurt Angle in real life a few years ago at a Atlantic City nightclub. He was like getting bottle service and he had a bunch of bros with him. And if I remember correctly, he tried the, do you know who I am thing on one of my friends? And she was like, no. <laughs> he was very muscly and he was very short. <laughs> Anyway, back to Chris Benoit. Chris was absolutely respected by colleagues and peers. The fans loved him. He was approaching like legendary status. He was also making a ton of money, you know, lots of merchandise and sponsorship opportunities. He and his longtime bestie, Eddie Guerrero, even teamed up together for a while. And in 2004, Chris reached the pinnacle of pro wrestling. He won WrestleMania 20 at Madison Square Garden. Earlier that night, Eddie had actually won the WWE title and he joined Chris in the ring. There was confetti in the air. They were hugging. It was like a moment. It was a whole thing. But even though Chris's family was there that night to celebrate with him, things at home weren't always confetti and championship belts. Let's talk about steroids. But first, let me put on my eyebrows. BRB. Okay, so steroids. Now I'm not going to make any sweeping generalizations or accusations about steroids and professional wrestling, but many wrestlers have come forward and admitted using steroids or human growth hormone or other performance enhancing drugs to help them maintain or even grow muscle mass. And in professional wrestling, the pressure to be literally larger than life is overwhelming. And that's separate and apart from the physical toll that it takes on the body, you know, the painkillers that are needed just to be able to get out of bed and be able to walk. Steroid use has some pretty serious side effects you know, other than muscle growth. It can cause paranoia, anxiety, and aggression, commonly known as roid rage. Many people would later say that Chris Benoit was often paranoid, but he was never described by anybody as somebody exhibiting roid rage. On May 12th of 2003, Nancy Benoit filed for a restraining order and started the paperwork for a divorce. She cited cruel treatment and irreconcilable differences, although, the restraining order doesn't explicitly say that Chris was violent toward her or her son. It said, quote, the respondent is a professional wrestler and considerably larger and stronger than the petitioner. The respondent lost his temper and threatened to strike the petitioner and caused extensive damage to the house and personal belongings, including furniture and furnishings. So the arguments 
were heated and Chris had trouble keeping his cool. And it had to be pretty scary to have an actual professional wrestler screaming in your face, throwing furniture, flipping tables and shit. Nancy and Chris actually ended up separating for six months living apart. But then she retracted all of the filings because she and Chris intended to work through the issues and were trying to patch things up. We now know that Chris and Nancy actually separated many times during their marriage. She didn't approve of the way that he mixed alcohol with his painkillers and she hated his heavy steroid use. He was also quite paranoid and he had a hair trigger temper and it made things volatile. On November November 13th, 2005, hours before a scheduled wrestling appearance, Chris's best friend, Eddie Guerrero, was found unconscious but still alive in his Minneapolis hotel room. He'd passed out in the bathroom and his nephew, Chavo, called for help. Chavo was also a pro wrestler. Everyone's a wrestler. Well, by the time the ambulance arrived, 38-year-old Eddie was dead. So Eddie had had previous issues with drug addiction and steroid use that contributed to an underlying undiagnosed case of heart disease. Well, Chris Benoit was inconsolable, destroyed, totally crushed. I love you and I'll never forget you. And I will see each other again. I love you, Eddie. <laughs> Losing Eddie like that just threw Chris out of orbit. You know, he had just lost his center. Many people would later say that Chris was never the same after Eddie's death. The feelings in the ring. You hit a great Eddie Chase. He kept working actually after that, but finally in May of 2006, Chris took some time off to try to cope with the impact of losing Eddie. And by the way, Eddie was just one of many people in the wrestling circle that met an untimely death, either by drug overdose or suicide or heart attack or some other unthinkable tragedy. It was just a lot to deal with. Well, Chris fell into a depression and his paranoia also went through the roof. He became very very obsessed with security, you know, checking the house's alarm over and over at night. When they would go out into town to run errands, he would insist that they change their paths like they were being followed or something. He was just really convinced that the family was being stalked. They weren't, by the way. He even moved the family out of Peachtree City to a more rural, gated, remote area of Fayetteville, Georgia. In June of 2007, Chris was drafted to the ECW, the Extreme Championship Wrestling, a branch of the WWE. So many letters. He was meant to serve as like a mentor of sorts, you know, for rising stars. On Tuesday, June 19th, Chris defeated Elijah Burke in the televised tournament semifinal held in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it would end up being his last time in the ring. So Chris flew home after the match as he typically would. He would spend the next couple of days running errands, working out, resting. Chris was scheduled to appear at some non-televised events that weekend in Texas and was to face off against CM Punk at the upcoming pay-per-view championship title event to take place that Sunday, June 24th. Are we about to kiss right now? On Friday, June 22nd, Chris took his young son Daniel to his horse riding lessons. Afterward, Chris went to a routine checkup at his family doctor. He left that appointment with a prescription for Zoloft to help with his depression. Remember, he's still kind of getting over Eddie. And that kind of medicine takes a couple of weeks to kick in, you know. After he got home, Chris spoke with Chavo Guerrero, who he'd gotten really close to after Eddie's death, and everything seemed pretty normal. At this point, Chavo was his travel buddy for performances, so they would often make arrangements to pick each other up from airports, blah, blah, blah. You get it. Well, that night around 9.30 p.m., a flurry of phone calls was made from the Benoit house. One was made to information to get the number for the police department, who was never called. And then three calls were made to the neighbor that went unanswered and no messages were left. We can assume now that those calls were made by Nancy after getting into some kind of argument, a heated argument with Chris. That night, Chris overpowered Nancy as she watched TV in an upstairs room. There was evidence later found in the room that indicated that she had definitely fought back. Bruises were found on her body. There was some blood on the back of her head like it had been hit on the floor. Floor, you know. Chris bound her hands and feet with tape 
And then as she was on her stomach, he looped an electrical cord around her neck. Chris put a knee in her back and then held on to the electrical cords and strangled her to death. He then wrapped her dead body up in a blanket and placed a Bible next to her. She was 43 years old. Hours later, we're not quite sure of the time, Chris attacked his seven-year-old child, Daniel, choking him to death while he laid in his bed. He placed a Bible next to his body as well. Toxicology reports would show that Daniel had been sedated with Xanax, so he was very likely unconscious when all of this happened. The next morning, Chris called Daniel's horse riding camp and told them he wasn't feeling well and wouldn't make it. Throughout the day, Chris was actually in contact with multiple people. He told the neighbor that Daniel and Nancy were very sick in bed with a terrible case of food poisoning. He talked to wrestling colleagues about that evening's scheduled show in Beaumont, Texas, and that he wasn't going to be able to make it for the same reason. When Chris spoke with Chavo that afternoon, he told him the same food poisoning poisoning story regarding Nancy and Daniel, that he had to take them to the hospital, they were vomiting up blood, it was a whole thing, and he wasn't going to be able to make it to the match. At the end of the call, Chris ended the conversation with, Chavo, I love you. And I'm like, okay, brother, I, I love you too, man. Hmm. That was weird. In the wee wee hours of Sunday, June 24th, Chris sent five text messages from both he and Nancy's cell phones to Chavo and another coworker travel buddy. One message was Chris's physical address there in Fayetteville, Georgia, and the other message says something about the dogs being out in the enclosed pool area and the back door was left unlocked. Then Chris Benoit went down to his home gym and rigged his lat pull-down machine with extra weights. He looped the cable around his neck, and when he released the pin on the weight, he was lifted up off the ground, hanging himself. He left no note. He was 40 years old. Chris Benoit was the consummate professional. You know, he never missed anything, especially not without notice. It wasn't like him to just ditch work, especially something that he loved so much. So when Chris didn't show up to Texas for this televised pay-per-view event, producers and WWE leaders tried to reach out to him, of course, but to no avail. The event, of course, went on without him and they cited a undisclosed family emergency. I mean, obviously they have no idea what's going on. But the next day, Chavo shared the strange text message that he and the other guy had received with WWE Talent Relations, and then they contacted the local police to perform a wellness check. When the deputies arrived at the Benoit house around 12.45 p.m. on Monday, June 25th, 2007, they encountered a little problem, uh, two little problems, <laughs> two very intimidating German shepherds. Luckily for them, the next door neighbor was out and she could help. The dogs knew her, you know, whenever the Benoits traveled, she would feed them. So she was able to wrangle the dogs pretty easily then they made a grisly discovery. Chris Benoit, his wife Nancy, and their son Daniel were all dead. And they relayed this information back to the WWE, who were preparing for this elaborate three-hour memorial service for Vince McMahon's character. Well, now we are right back where we started. Chairman Vince McMahon told all of the performers that they weren't obligated in any way to participate in that night's show or any of the following shows that week. The McMahon memorial was scrapped, and in its place, they aired a tribute to Chris Benoit. WWE superstar Chris Benoit, his wife Nancy, and their son Daniel are dead. We here in the WWE can only offer our condolences. Tonight will be a tribute to Chris Benoit. They had no idea that Chris Benoit had annihilated his family, but after learning the details of the investigation, the Benoit tribute and anything else involving him was removed from their website, publications, and all future broadcasts. Someone who was undoubtedly one of their greatest wrestlers and a hands-down WWE Hall of Fame inductee, one of the greatest WWE superstars of all time, was unceremoniously erased. It didn't take long for the case to be ruled a murder-suicide, so why would somebody at the top of their game 
do such a thing. Chris Benoit's autopsy report would reveal hydrocodone, Xanax, and superhuman levels of testosterone, indicating steroid use. Investigators also found a fuck ton of steroids and HGH and related things inside the Benoit's house. An investigation revealed a very elaborate and long-running steroid procurement scheme, but it was less that the steroids caused extreme aggression and more that it just ruined the marriage between Nancy and Chris. Among many things, Chris wasn't able to perform in the bedroom. He was gone far too often, and then when he was home, they fought about practically everything. Nancy hated how aggressive it made Chris act, especially towards her and their son. Nancy was also abusing pills and alcohol herself. She was just sick of the life, sick of WWE, and wanted him to get out of it. After the autopsy, Chris's brain was actually examined by the head of neurosurgery at West Virginia University and the results, of course, showed that he suffered from CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I said it on the first try. Chris's brain had been jiggled around so much over the years that he had signs of early onset dementia and it was comparatively in the same condition of an 85 year old Alzheimer's patient. This level of brain damage would have certainly affected his mood and impulse control and problem solving and personality. I've gone into detail about CTE and other cases. I'll link that video down below and I'll put it up here in the card if you're interested. In addition to this severe brain damage, Chris also had a very enlarged heart, like double the weight of a normal healthy heart, which indicates years of steroid abuse. The attending physician said that had this terrible murder-suicide event not occurred, Chris would have been dead in less than a year anyway. In February of 2008, the official investigation determined that Chris Benoit acted alone killing his wife and son, and then he took his own life, closing the case. After the Chris Benoit tragedy, the WWE had a lot to answer for, both by the press and by a congressional inquiry. It served as a wake-up call for the WWE to tighten the reins on performance-enhancing drugs and the unnecessarily dangerous maneuvers in the ring. They enacted changes to take concussions more seriously and to enforce substance regulations. And whether or not these changes made a difference it's up for debate. What do you think? Sound off in the comments below. And that is the story of Chris Benoit. Thanks again to Colleen and Jennifer and everyone else who recommended the story. I appreciate you. If you want to make a recommendation for a crew time case that you'd like to see me cover, there is a link to a Google doc down in the description box where you can fill in the dirty details. I would love to hear from you. If also you wanna know what makeup I used in today's look, everything is linked down below. If I use something that's not available, I'll find you something similar. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the other socials. Actually, all of the other socials. <laughs> that is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! I know the WCW and the WWE are like different companies. I, I just don't care. I just had a giant energy drink. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Wow, my teeth are pure corn. <laughs> <laughs> to Bri Brian. His name is not Brian. Oh, I didn't wet my sponge. <laughs> if that sounds like Motherfucker. Woo! <laughs> <clears throat> Did I already fucking say that? To face off. Fuck. <laughs> Road rage. Different thing. <laughs> my remote. Being a little bratty. Fuck, fuck, fuck. What am I doing? Oh my god.